So you know my heart, it is a privilege to be standing here to open God's word with you. To think that it was when I was 17 years old, I was right up there getting baptized in this church. And then like a snap, here we are many, many years later. And so if you have a Bible with you, uh, I would ask that you would turn to John chapter 7 verse 53. If you don't have a Bible with you, there is one in front of you. There's a pew Bible there, and I think if you turn to page 757 on the pew Bible, it, that's the right page. Could someone confirm that for me? Yes, I see that hand, thank you. I want you to be looking at the word this morning. You can test whether or not I'm telling the truth, whether I'm telling you the truth from Scripture, because this is probably one of the single most difficult passages in the book of John. And so then Dave says, hey, Tom, why don't you preach it? <laughs> Thank you very much. But it's a privilege to share this word with you this morning because I am so excited to be a part of what God is doing in our midst. The Holy Spirit is working in our midst. Is he not? Amen. I love the diversity of people as they walk through the door. We come into this place with all kinds of stories, with all kinds of journeys. We are broken. We are, we are in pieces. And we walk through the doors because maybe the Holy Spirit has called us to come here in this place at this time. And we come here, and because of the Holy Spirit... We receive restoration. We have our lives put back together in the image of Christ. Amen? And I am asking the Holy Spirit that he would do that in our lives today. And if you get the, uh, you, and you should, by the way, if you get the, the cross point connection, if you haven't yet, you need to see someone at the desk out there at the end of the service today and sign up for that because in there, if you got it, you'll notice that I used three little words that were in italics and they're now on your uh, sermon notes or your outline. And if you didn't get the sermon notes, you should go get them right now. You can come back. You'll be fine. Three, there's three little words on there. Out of what? They're out of place. This passage is tough because it's completely out of place. It's, I, let me tell you the truth. This passage is an orphan. Why does it belong here? How come it's stuck in here? If you have your Bible open, if you look at the Pew Bible on page 757, what do you see right, probably right above verse 53? And in fact, uh, you know how jealous I am, Dave, that you can just look at stuff without glasses on? I'm telling you, the, the, the NIV says this, the earliest manuscripts and other ancient witnesses do not have this passage. And so what does it do? It's, as we read it, as, you, as, as I point this out, maybe you've already dwelled on this before, but as I point it out, you're going to go, yeah, it's sort of just stuck in there. What's going on? There's... Early manuscripts and other ancient witnesses don't have this passage in John here. And so, because Dave asked, and because I think the Lord laid it on my heart, we're going to do a little seminary class. To begin with, don't groan, don't groan. We're going to talk about the textual criticism, okay? And I'm going to explain to you, I'm going to explain to you a little bit what that is, okay? You notice that the NIV says early manuscripts. You ever wonder how we got the New Testament in the form that we do? Did we just, uh, you know, have a whole entire leather-bound Bible in the New Living Translation, which is what this is. I'm going to be preaching out of the NLT this morning. Is that how we got the Bible to us? No. No. You see, there's multiple pieces of the New Testament that we have. We're talking just the New Testament now. Um, there are pieces, and they call them manuscripts or codices. Uh, there are fragments, right? They're written on all sorts of things. Papyrus, have you ever heard of papyrus? Yeah, it's just, it's just wood that you mash flat and make paper out of it, and then you write on it. We actually have papyri with scripture written on them, little pieces of them. 
In fact, the earliest manuscripts we have are of the book of John. And those early manuscripts, those copies, those pieces, and sometimes it's just little fragments. Sometimes it's just a little bit of a book that we have. And, and um, can you guess how many there are? No, you can't, no. 6,000 pieces or man, of manuscripts in, in just Greek, right? Just 6,000 of them. And, and this is the best attestation. There are more copies and more pieces of the ancient text known as the New Testament than any other ancient document on planet Earth. You think that there's a Lord who is watch caring to make sure we have his word? 6,000 or 5,800 and something. We find more manuscripts every year, so that number keeps going up. And so with those 6,000, you know what we can do? We can take them all and we can lay them out and we can lay them over each other. We can go, okay, this book of John, wait, the oldest ones don't have 53 through 811. Why, what, what's going on there? Well, it's, it's just not there. So what do we do with that? Well, we put a parenthesis around it. We go, wait a minute. This is not maybe original to the book of John. In fact, if you read 752 and then skip over to 812, you should do that right now. It reads very smoothly. You can tell John's thought was kind of finishing at 752, and he picks back up in the text in 7 or 812. It just flows. And then you've got this orphan passage of, it's a very famous passage, is it not? The woman caught in adultery, we talk about it all the time. And so I hope I'm not giving you an uh-oh, because I'm going to give you some assurance. Okay, hang on. Stick with me. So we've got all these manuscripts, we lay them over each other, and we see that this little passage in John doesn't show up in John until like 900 A.D., and those manuscripts thereafter show them there. <clears throat> so we can be pretty sure that somebody was reading through this section that Jesus and the Pharisees are going back and forth and the, the authorities of the ancient Near East of the Jews, known as the Pharisees, they're battling for who has the better judgment, right? If you don't shake your heads and go, yes, Dave's going to be very hurt, there's this battle. Who has the better take on what the scriptures mean and what they say? And he's talking about all these hard teachings. And he says, I'm the bread of life. No, you don't understand. You are missing the central part and heart of what the scriptures are meant to do. They're meant to point to me. And Jesus is basically going to say to us today, you can't fulfill the law. The law I'm giving to you so that you might be able to realize that you cannot fulfill the law. I'm going to do that for you. And when it comes time for you to answer for your sins, I am going to sweep you behind me and protect you under my wings. And I'm going to take the brunt of the sin that is going to kill your soul. Okay, so we, we, we know that they're not there. You read the text, and this text we're going to go on today, you read certain sections of it, and you go, wait, this doesn't sound like John at all. You know somebody, who's someone that you're really super familiar with? And if you had them write a letter, and somebody else read their letter, could you tell it was them? Just because some of the sayings that they use, the phrasing, you know, that's kind of what we're looking at here in John. We read this section in John 53 through 811, and it's totally foreign wording. In fact, we're going to see that it's actually a lot more like Luke. Luke Acts. If you read Luke Acts, this section here looks just like Luke. And so we've got this little orphan passage. We have to ask the question then, is this scripture? Have, have you thought that? I mean, is this really, can we trust what it says? Because we know it wasn't original. And scholars have said, yes, I think we can, because a, a, a really smart guy in, in my life, he was one of my professors at Trinity, name drop time, D.A. Carson, both these guys over here, has used the name D.A. Carson while I had him in class. <laughs> nana, nana boo-boo. 
He's a really super smart guy. He and other scholars, both men and women, who are a lot smarter than me, say, yes, we're, we're absolutely sure that this is an actual event that happened. This is an account of something that actually happened. But for whatever reason, it was orphaned and never placed in Scripture. And then somebody was reading through John, and they were going, wait a minute, John's arguing about who's got the better judgment. Let's put this in here because it absolutely illustrates perfectly the point, the central theme of what Jesus is saying. Your pharisaical understanding of the gospel does not match up with the Father's heart. And I'm here to show you what that looks like. And as we look at the woman caught in adultery today, you and I are going to see the heart of the Father displayed by the Son. And so as we walk through this, I want you to do something. I want you to put yourself in the place of the woman. You're ashamed because you've been caught. Your sin is exposed. You know you haven't measured up. You're lost. My sin has broken me. I am ashamed to think of of the things that I've done in my life, Lord. I don't want you to see them. Please don't look. You ever been there? Amen, so have I. Too often, even after Jesus became Lord of my life, and Jesus says, oh, no, I'm not taken by surprise by this. I died for that stuff. And the the, the one point I want you to walk away from is on that little half sheet. You'll see it there. And that's that when Jesus is confronted with our sin, when he is confronted with our sin, he floods in his forgiveness. That's the point of the gospel. That's the judgment piece that Jesus has been arguing with them on. See, the Pharisees want to use the law like a tool so that they can strong arm people. And Jesus says, my gospel, my foundation of my law is a law of grace, of forgiveness and mercy. Remember, grace and mercy are both sides of a coin that we all want. Grace is when we get what we don't deserve. Mercy is when we don't get what we do deserve. And that, Jesus says, is the foundation of my gospel. That's why it's the main point. I think it's the thing that Jesus is displaying here in this text that when we confront Jesus with our sin, when you and I finally come to a place where we're broken enough and we turn and and say, Jesus, I'm lost without you. I'm done trying harder. I'm worn out. My sin is ever present in my life. Please take my sin. And he goes, look, I'll take that sin and I'm going to give you forgiveness. I'm going to give you grace and mercy. And so why can we preach this passage today? Because the, the message of 753 through 811 is absolutely in line with everything we see about Jesus in the texts. You read the Gospels, and this is absolutely the same Jesus as we see in this text. And I want you to put yourself in the place of the woman so that you can feel what it's like to be her. Because you know why? Because you and I have been in that place. And today I want you to be understand unequivocally that if you have not been freed from that sin you can be freed from that sin because no matter what you've done Jesus died for that he had you in mind in your sin while he was hanging on the cross and said that's my burden let me take that for you and he floods forgiveness in and he enters your life and he remakes our souls in a way that when the Father looks at us, when we're before the throne of judgment, he goes, there's one of mine. I see my reflection in their heart. And so that's a lot to remember and a lot to think of. But we're going to get into this passage, and I want you to look at the text. I want you to see it, and remember that that forgiveness is ours. Verse 53. Then the meeting broke up and everybody went home. Does that sound like a fluid transition to anyone? See what I mean? It's like, there was a scribe who goes, this is a good passage, I'm going to throw it in there. So everybody just went home. But then it picks back up and it says, it continues on, verse 1 of chapter 8. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives. Now stop right there. If you're in a Bible and you're not sure where Luke 21 is, 
you'll turn to the left a few pages. Luke 21 is left a few pages. Luke 21, verse 38, which I really personally think is where this passage actually belongs. Because in 37 and 38, we get described by Luke the exact thing that's going on in 8.1 in John. So it says, Every day, Jesus went to the temple to teach, and each evening he returned to spend the night on the, come on, what does it say? Mount of, this is audience participation. It's going to the Mount of Olives, okay? Mark says Bethany, I think. Bethany, basically the, the, the edge of, of Bethany is the Mount of Olives. It's right next to Jerusalem. So Jesus is probably hanging out with Lazarus and his two, uh, her, his two sisters, Lazarus, two sisters, Mary and Martha. He's, that's probably what he's saying. And he's kind of moving back and forth. And so that's what's going on. And it lands us in this text of John chapter 8, verse 1, where he is traveling back down. Remember back in, uh, uh, at the beginning uh, of this seven where... Jesus' brothers say, well, you just go down to Jerusalem and show yourself. And if you think you're all that in a ham sandwich, go show yourself to them. And Jesus is like, not my time. And and it's only going to be in my way that the Father has laid out for me. And so this is a part of that. He goes down quietly. Remember, he's been doing that. And he goes to the temple by day. And he he, he travels back to probably Lazarus' house at night. And so that's absolutely where we are. So when when I tell you that this is telling us stuff that we know is true... I want you to see that, that this is, this is stuff that's going on that's not weird. It's not out of the ordinary. It's just out of the ordinary for John. Get it? Got it. Okay. So then he says, uh, John, uh, the, the author, whoever wrote this, says, but early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. Here's another, that, he, that it says that he sat down. That's absolutely what a rabbi does. He would, and when you sit down, it's time for teaching. And so Jesus is sat down, and he began to do what? To teach them. And he's been amazing people, right and left. And he keeps coming back, and there's, there's a bit of a thing going on here. Because he sit down, and he's teaching, and he's teaching in a way that's powerful. And people are coming to him and eating up what he has to say. And he's getting popular. And you know what power structures don't like? Is when they feel their power slipping. The Pharisees feel their power slipping. And so what do they do? We've got to come up with a plan. We've got to figure out a way to get this guy. I don't care if he's really the Messiah or not. It's my contention that I think they kind of knew he was the Messiah, but wanted to hang on to their power so much and were so steeped in their power and the sin of that power that they were willing to do whatever they could to get this guy quiet. You ever speak the truth and have people just get mad at you and want to shut you up? Jesus went first. All right, so they're, they, they, bring this, uh, they, they bring up this case, they set a trap, right? They're trying to set a trap on Jesus. And as a matter of fact, the, the first half of, of verse 6, I believe, says that exact thing. Look at verse 6. Uh, they were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. Okay, keep your finger in John and flip over to Mark chapter 12. Verse 13, this is another point that I want to show you, that this trap setting has been something that's been going on. They want Jesus out of the way. They're willing to do whatever they can. They're willing to use whatever they can. They don't care about people. They care about their power. Mark chapter 12, verse 13. Later the leaders sent some Pharisees and supporters of Herod to trap Jesus into saying something for which he could be arrested. Okay, you're going to get Tom version here, so get ready. Teacher, they said, we know how honest you are. You are impartial and don't play favorites. You teach the way, God, uh, the way of God truthfully. Now tell us, 
Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or shouldn't we? John chapter 8 says they're trying to set a trap. Does that fit? Absolutely. And it's, I, it's, it's so, I couldn't do snotty well enough. Try to channel my kids when they were little. But there's a snottiness to the Mark chapter 12. And because they don't care about whether the, the content of Jesus and what he's saying. They want him out. They're setting a trap. So they set this trap. And what is the trap? It's the one that we know very well, don't we? As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught and we're going to stop right there. They brought a woman. She's been caught in what? Okay, Bible scholars, what's missing already? Thank you. Anybody ever heard of adultery without two to tango? Why on earth is it just the woman? I would suggest to you that what was going on at that time, in that season, when Jesus is being confronted by this trap, air quotes, he's not trapped, by the way, just so you don't, don't get scared, he's not trapped. He's way ahead of him, right? He's, he's Jesus. But there was a double standard at this time, a double standard. What was that double standard? Women guilty. Men look the other way. Do whatever you want to, guys. It's the boys' club. Guess what Jesus doesn't stand for? That kind of thing. He doesn't stand for it. Not, not for a moment. As you and I are brought by the enemy or others in our lives as accusers. There's this woman. She's brought caught in the act of adultery. Does that tell you where the witnesses were in the moment? It's embarrassing. I got to preach this in church. Thanks a lot. But they, so for someone to bring a public charge like this, there was a requirement. Two male witnesses, sorry ladies, that's the time we're in right here. Women were not to be trusted in a court of law. It's just the way it was. It shouldn't have been. Jesus is saving us from stuff like that too. Two witnesses, male witnesses, and they have to tell exactly the same story. And it has to be true and provable. And so they bring this woman caught in the act. Anybody else smell a setup? How do you, caught, how do you catch someone in the act like this as Pharisees and teachers of the law? I'm guessing that they, this is off text, but here we go. I'm guessing they knew about this. Someone had reported it to them. They set it up, they put some people in the room or, or somewhere so that they could see and, and witness this act, and they thought, we can do this. Jesus, this teaching of how he approaches the law and the Sabbath, we're going to get him with this one. Watch, this is the, this is the death knell. This is when Jesus, we've got him. And they have two witnesses of this act happening. You know what else the law says? This is from silence, but I want you to know. You know what the, else the law says? It says if you catch somebody or if you know of somebody who is about to sin, what are you supposed to do? Rescue them from it. Turn them aside from that thing. So what did these two witnesses not do? Ultimately, they didn't care two wits about this woman or her heart or what this was going to do to her. They didn't care. You know why? They wanted to use her for their own purposes, just like they're using the law for their own purposes. That's why Jesus is so upset at the Pharisees. They're missing the point. Jesus came to fulfill the law, not to abolish it. He was absolutely in line with what the law said, but not the way the Pharisees were handling it. And so this 
Woman caught in adultery, two witnesses, they don't do a thing to stop it, they don't bring the man, and they bring her in front of everyone. That's what the text says. They put her in front of the crowd. They put her in front of the crowd. How embarrassing is that? How many of us who have a private sin that would be super embarrassing if anybody knew it? I can't imagine what it's like for her. Can you imagine her trembling? She knows the law. She probably knows what's coming. Get caught by the Pharisees, you're in deep trouble. And so there she is in front of everyone. Ugh. You know, you just do wrong things, but to be, have it opened up like this. I don't know, I just I got stuck on this part, and I just was so embarrassed. If some of the things that I do, you all got to see like this. I'm so thankful. Jesus knows all of that, by the way, and he still died for me. And you. He died for you, too. All of those really gross things that you would be totally embarrassed that anyone knew, he died for that. And he says, I'm, I'm putting my image in you. And so there she is, stuck, caught. And so they, they, what they think is setting the trap. Teacher, they say, which is a respect, it's rabbi, right? Teacher, oh great teacher. They said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. I don't know why English accent works better there, but. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? Well, let's stop there. You know what it, the stoning means? It tells us something about who she is and what place in her life she is. Because a stoning for act of adultery means she was not yet married, but was a fiancé. She was engaged. And that the, 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 the punishment for that, the scriptures say, was stoning. The scriptures, Moses' law, and they're throwing it all in there, right? Use Moses. He's the powerhouse. It's his law that he wrote that God gave to him twice. Tablets. Right? That's what it says. What do you say, Jesus? And let's understand something. Do you know what stoning actually looked like? So if you and I were there, and we were first century Jews, stoning meant that you would take her, bind her hands behind her back, you would bury her to above her waist in the ground. And then you would stone her. Many uh, uh, people say, yeah, they would pick up heavy stones and throw at her. The witnesses we have out of archaeology suggest it's more like this. Ugh! It's horrifying. Imagine the panic in her right now. The embarrassment, the panic. She's in tears. I can't imagine that she's not. And what do you say, Jesus? And we're caught in this moment, of this tense moment. It's in public square. It's no more public than that. We're in the outer courts of the temple. Everybody's watching. They were trying, verse 6a, to trap him into saying something they could use against him. And that's where she stops in the story. Because then... Jesus, look at the next point. Jesus saw him coming. He knew it. He saw him coming a mile away. He wasn't taken by surprise by this. Two little words move us into the next point. But Jesus. But Jesus. There it is. The whole text turns on a dime. And if, if I'm giving you images of this woman, she thinks this is coming hands behind her back, buried up to her waist, but Jesus. And I want you to see this image. It's like Jesus steps spiritually in front of her, even though she's surrounded on every side. 
What he does for her, what he does for you and me, he does this. He says, nope. I'm standing in front of you. I am putting you behind me. You are now under my protection. The scriptures, you know how the scriptures describe God the Father? He's like a a hen gathering his chicks under his feathers. That's absolutely what happens at the moment we read but Jesus. Because the text goes a totally different way. But Jesus, and then it says he started to write in in the dust. I don't know what he wrote. Do you know what he wrote? That's like one of those things that young seminarians like to get together and give all sorts of fancy answers about. Nobody knows. But he starts writing. And it changes everything. He's doing something in a way that just breaks the the, the tone and the trajectory of the moment. And so he just starts doodling whatever he's writing in the dust. And then what does the next verse say? They won't be put off, will they? They won't be put off. They kept badgering him. Hey, what's your answer, Jesus? What are you going to do about her? And because Jesus has put her behind him, he's protecting her. He's got her. Spiritually, he's like, I am standing between you and your sin right now. Watch what it looks like when that happens. The text. Look at your text. Read it. It's a, and i got to put my glasses back on. Sorry. They kept demanding an answer, verse 7. So he stood up again and said, All right, but the one who is without sin, you cast the first stone. Okay, so let's ask some important questions here. Because Jesus saw him coming a mile away. He knew what they were going to be bringing to him. And I would suggest that he, in asking this question... Obviously, he just absolutely deflates. I mean, there's a giant javelin that goes through the bubble that they had. Uh, The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, it's completely burst in this moment. But let's not, don't hear what I'm not saying. That's one of my sayings. Am I, does this text say that you have to be perfect and without sin to challenge anybody uh, in their sin? The only person that could do that was, is, yeah, that's a Sunday school answer. It wasn't a squirrel. It was Jesus. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer, is he not? He's the only one that could do that. We're going to see later, he absolutely doesn't. He does the opposite of accuse her. And so, what does this passage mean? This is something we know. Jesus is saying, well, actually, you'll see what I mean by this. He's actually pointing right at the double standard. That I talked about earlier. He's saying, he's putting the double standard on display. Those of you who are not guilty of adultery, you can cast the first stone. Doesn't that make more sense now? Yes. He's saying, if you have never committed adultery, then you can throw the first stone. There's a guy who knows, he's the real Santa Claus. I know when you are sleeping, I know when... But Jesus is the real one. He knows everything we do. And he knows their hearts, and he knows these men who are using this woman. They don't care a bit about her. They don't care what the true meaning of the law is. They just care that they can twist it and use it for their ends and their devices and what they want to do. That's absolutely what the enemy does, does he not? He takes scripture and he twists it. Think about when Jesus was... In the wilderness, and the devil quoting scripture to Jesus, and he's like, yeah, let me quote some back to you. Man does not live on bread alone. So they're twisting this. And Jesus says, if you're not guilty of adultery, go ahead and cast the first stone. You know how all that, that's the meaning of it? Who starts to walk away first? The older guys do. That's right, the older people start, the older men, they start walking away. Why? Because they have more double standard in their life, let me just put it that way, than the younger guys. And the younger guys are still full of themselves and they just want to be self-righteous. But eventually, what happens? Everybody. After he stooped down, again, verse 8, he wrote in the dust. Then verse 9 begins overwhelming forgiveness. The message 
the central message that John, you know, I wish there was a passage of John that told us the theme of why he's writing the book. It would just be great if it was a passage that said that. It's 2031. It's 2031. I can't leave it there. It's 2031. John chapter 20, verse 31. But it's being displayed right here, is it not? That message of John 31, that's why I think we can look at this and go, yes, it's telling the same story. There's nothing wrong with dwelling on this passage. And so, when the accusers heard this, they, I like the NLT, they slipped away. What is, I don't know what your passage, I forget, I forget what they all say, but they slunk away. It's kind of like, um, they just slip off, right? Because they know Jesus has got them. They thought they were setting a trap. They didn't know they were setting a trap for themselves. That's what the devil does for himself. He sets a trap for himself. Doesn't pay attention to scripture. Doesn't understand the power of God. Doesn't understand that the power is in the word. And so they slink away. And the text has just totally gained in momentum towards forgiveness. I mean, it's just, it picks up speed. They left one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. The only guy who could accuse her because he was sinless in the sin of adultery. The two of them are standing there. And now she sees full well how much Jesus had her protected under his feathers. How he stood in front of her and said, no you don't. You're not using my God's my father's law that way. No, you don't. Then Jesus stood up again, and finally he speaks to the woman. And he says to her, Woman, where are your accusers? Now, woman, the word he uses there is a, is a word of respect. The same word that he uses here is the one that he uses when he's hanging on the cross and he tells John to come up and say, hey, hey, woman, mom, come here. I want John to be your son now. He's going to take care of you. He refers to his mom with the same word, woman. It's a, wo a word of respect. A woman caught in adultery. And Jesus uses the highest respect for her. Don't let the world tell you that Jesus is not respectful of women. He is our he is our guide. He is our example of love and acceptance, no matter what you look like, no matter what you've done. And so Jesus has turned on a dime the shame that those accusers were trying to heap on her. He's shamed them for their hypocrisy. And so now how in the world is he going to deal with this woman? Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? Not even one. He has turned them all aside. When Jesus is confronted with our sin, he floods in with his forgiveness. You're going to see it here real soon. Where are your accusers? Are there any left? And her, her response, no. And then she uses the word, Lord, now that can be small L or capital L, I think it's capital L, because of what he says next. He says, no, Lord, there is no one there. No one is accusing me, and she's looking at the Savior and seeing him, probably seeing him for the first time, when he says, neither do I. You see, when we confront Jesus with our sin, he floods in forgiveness. Because neither do I is not a fancy way for Jesus to get around saying, you are forgiven. She fully understood what that meant. She understood, and I want you to understand that Jesus says, I forgive you. She sees that moment that Jesus is taking the sin that she felt so ashamed. She was so afraid. And now she has nothing to fear because she's in the presence of the Savior. 
neither do I. And then he says, the second part, stop doing that. You know, because if we don't go there, we don't really understand forgiveness. You see, and what Jesus has done is he's ripped apart the self-centered take of the law, and he's put in its place grace and mercy and love of God. And he's unpacking the message of salvation in one woman's life. And it really happened, right? And so this forgiveness has happened. But now, what do you see next in your outline? So what? So what? What, what do we do if we have studied all of this truth and then we don't do anything with it? It's so what? Who cares? Nice, past, nice sermon, Pastor. What was it about? So what is our takeaway? I'm going to suggest a few things, but the Holy Spirit, if you dwell on his word, the Holy Spirit will speak to you, and he will share with you what your takeaways are. It's on the backside. I want you to imagine, I'm going to bring it back up, imagine Jesus surrounding you spiritually like he did this woman. He's got you. He's protecting you. He is standing between you and the sin that accuses you and proclaims you guilty. Our sin cannot overcome the forgiveness of Jesus. Should I say that again? Our sin cannot overcome the forgiveness of Jesus. If we put our faith and our trust in Christ, he forgives us our sins and cleanses us from, and that's coming later, all unrighteousness. In John, he wrote that later, I should say. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That's a central truth. It goes right back to my, my one point. When, when Jesus is confronted with our sin, he floods his forgiveness. Secondly, he removes us from our shame and proclaims us forgiven. Don't let the devil remind you of your past. Remind him of his future. It's not just a saying. Look, he's trying, he's going to, the devil, people who don't believe that what's happened in your life is real, they're going to try and bring stuff back up in your life. I know who you are. Nope, you know who I was. You need to proclaim because of Jesus' blood. You need to proclaim victory over that stuff. It's been died for. It died on the cross with Jesus, and he rose again. That empty tomb proves that the resurrection happened, and he rose again, and we have forgiveness. That that is the stuff of the scriptures. If you don't get anything out of that today, uh, the message today, that's it. Now, let's talk a little bit about the go and sin no more. Now, I'm, i got to tell you that I spent a lot of time trying harder not to sin. Have you tried hard not to sin in your own flesh? How does that work out for you? If trying harder not to sin would work, the Pharisees would have been rock stars. Jesus would have said, hey, see these Pharisees? Follow them. They've got it if trying harder not to sin worked. So what does Jesus mean when he says, go and sin no more? He's saying, to, and I want to say this to you, focus on the cross, remember the forgiveness, the joy that you have in the, in the release of your sin. You've been released from your sin. You want to make your daddy proud. Remember what the father said of his son right after his baptism, behold my son, in whom I am well pleased. Guess how much ministry Jesus had done by that time? Zero. Why did he love his son and was well pleased in him? Because of who he was to him, his son. What happens when you and I become followers of Jesus? We're made his children. We're family. Jesus calls us his friend. That's the stuff we remember and we, we, we found our life on, the, the gospel of grace, not law. And when we, are, when we focus on that, we know that, that God the Father made this plan of salvation and he's hovering over us with his wings to protect us focus on that image and the thing you want to do is make your heavenly father proud of you and before you know it good stuff just ekes out of your life when we're filled with the holy spirit 
The Holy Spirit's like a cup. If you think of a cup and you fill it up, you ever filled it with water to the point where surface tension holds it in the cup? Now try and run without, without spilling it. That's when you and I get filled with the Spirit, that's what happens. We spill out onto others. That, that stuff just flows up and wells up in us. When we focus on the truth and not the lies that the enemy tries to tell us to do about our past, and we focus on that. If we try just trying harder not to sin, how well does that work for you? No, focus on the grace and the love of Jesus Christ and that he will help you not to sin. That's it. It's not hard. We make it hard. And so, as you and I come here today, you didn't know this, but this is a, when we peer deeply, I don't know, we, when we peer deeply into the Father, we see a, a, a perfect Father who loves you and me. I want to just end our time with focusing on who Jesus is. I want to offer to you the opportunity to trust Jesus this morning. I'm just, I don't know, maybe somebody came in here and they're just like, I don't know why I'm here. Jesus knew why you're here. Come to a Savior who died for your sins. You, you can't be hard enough to, to bear up under this life. You can't be tough enough. You can't hold your breath long enough. You're going to be overwhelmed by the flood. So right now, I'm not a guy who has to have people come forward. I'm not. But I am a guy who says, if you want to put your faith and trust in Christ today, and you do that, you need to tell somebody. You need to tell somebody that you did that. Somebody that you know loves Jesus already. Bust yourself out. Go public. Go public with your faith. Because today is the day of your salvation. I think, I think it's the perfect message to talk about time to come to Jesus you never have before so all I'm going to do is pray if you want to come down there there's who's here today that's doing ministry at, uh, Bob's going to be here for you if you want to pray with him I'll be here Dave will come up here there'll be people here for you I'm going to pray a prayer we're going to just let the spirit do what the spirit wants to do after a couple of moments, I'm just going to close this with a benediction out of Romans 15, 13, and we'll be dismissed, but let's answer the call if Jesus is calling you today. Heavenly Father, this is not a magical prayer. Nothing about what I'm saying that changes anything. The truth of the gospel changes everything. Right now, we confess you as Lord and Savior. Those of us who know you, who have been walking with you, we confess you as Lord and Savior. Those who maybe have never done that, today they are confessing you as Lord and Savior. They are finally tired enough and broken enough and ready to put their faith and trust in you. Father, I thank you that the Jesus, your Son, who is revealed, who showed us what you're like, is revealed in this passage today. That forgiveness is ours if we come to you. And so in, the, in this moment here, there are some who want to come to you right now. Let them just say that. Even now, Father, I want to come to you. Savior, forgive me of my sin. Release me from the burden and the shame. Place me under your wing. Let me enjoy eternity with you as one of your children. Father, we know that this is a truth that the world is trying to extinguish. There is a war going on. It's getting easier and easier to see that. But we stand for truth. We confess. We turn to you. In Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. If you want to come forward, you just go ahead and do that. I'm going to release us by turning to Romans 15, 13, one of my favorite passages in the scriptures. Not that anyone's better than another, but Romans 15, 13.
you would stand for the benediction. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.